he is not around today. So now I'm hosting this meeting on behalf of Dr. Kemp. So I'm very proud here to be with this uh, very honorable guest with me, Dr. Hideaki Fujita. So Fujita-san obtained his PhD in science from Waseda University at 1990. He worked at postdoc fellow at University of Iowa between 2000 to 2002 and then at Washington State University between 2002 to 2004, Toku University between 2004 to 2008, Toyota Central Research Lab between 2004 to 2010, as a junior PI at the NUS between 2010 to 2011, researcher at Wiccan Quantitative Biology Center between 2011 to 2012, Associate Professor at Osaka University between 2012 to 2017. And a Research Coordinator at Waseda Bioscience Research Institute in Singapore between 2017 and 2019. And now he is currently working as researcher at Riken Center for Biosystem Dynamics Research in Japan. So now he will present uh, his work using Raman scattering from single cell to predict the cell state. So without further ado, Fujita-san, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction, Freddy. Uh, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to talk here at this seminar today. I'm from Riken, one of the research institutes in Japan. I was working in Singapore before Riken at Research Institute of Waseda University, where I met Ken Lee, today's host, but uh, not, not around today. And I also met Ferdi here, and it was a good experience living in Singapore. And I wish to go back there if I have a chance to do so. Today, I'd like to talk about what we can do with Raman spectroscopy in cell biology, and how it is capable of knowing about the cells. But let me introduce about Riken before we go into science. Riken is a research institute in Japan operated by the Japanese government. So it's basically the same as ASTAR or in Singapore or NIH in the States. We are well funded. Um, it's about uh, 1.25 billion Singapore dollars per year. There are about 3,000 researchers in various fields, such as uh, physics or chemistry, life science, mathematics, computing, and such. Now, <clears throat> probably some of you might have done, but if you divide this 1.25 billion by 3,000 researchers, you have about 400,000 Singapore dollars. But don't worry, I am not paid that much. There are about 2,000 people working, other than researchers, such as people who are doing administrative jobs. We can also have to pay for equipment we use, or consumables, or electricity. But still, it's a big money, because those costs are for us scientists to do science. So, if you happen to become scientist in the future and uh, willing to work at Riken, there are opportunities for foreigners. There are a special postdoctoral research program for those who already have PhD and want to do research in Japan. There are international program associate uh, for those who are willing to get PhD in Japan. There are also uh, various summer schools but which wasn't held this year because of this uh, coronavirus thing. About 22% of the researchers in Riken are international, that means non-Japanese. And among them, about 10% are from Southeast Asia, including Singapore. Although I have ne never met Singaporean scientists in Riken yet. About 15% uh, of the researchers are female, and if you see this uh, figure here, you probably understand that Riken doesn't really care about LGBTs. 
same as Singapore. Riken is a very big institute, so it's widespread in Japan. The headquarter is in Wako here, Saitama. And world's first supercomputer is in here, around here, Kobe. Um, there are Spring A, uh, large synchrotron is here in Hyogo. There are also overseas offices. We also have office in Singapore, situated inside Biopolis. It will be seventh floor of Helios building. So if you're interested in Riken International Program, you can just knock on their door. They will probably provide you with more details. Our lab is in here, Osaka area. If you're planning to visit Japan in the near future, I recommend Osaka as your starting point. Not for the science, but for the fun part. Osaka is an exciting city itself. You can enjoy shopping in Osaka, where almost everything is cheaper than in Tokyo. This is Osaka Castle. This Osaka Castle is a rebuilt castle in modern days, so it's not much of a value. But you can see a real Japanese castle in Hikone, which was built in 1622. And it's only about 1.5 hours from Osaka, out here. So Kyoto, probably very famous for the tourists, is also about one hour from Osaka. And Nara, which was capital of Japan before Kyoto, is also about one hour from Osaka. If you travel one hour by Shinkansen to the west, you can visit Himeji with beautiful white castle. So starting a trip from Tokyo, uh, Japanese capital, is nice, but I think Osaka is better. Okay, now let's get back into science. This is the title of my talk today, uh, using Raman scatter from single cell to predict the cell state. And first, why do you want to know about the cell or the cell state? Knowing about cell is knowing about our cells, because our body is basically made up of cells. Mostly mammalian cells, but there are lots of uh, bacterium inside you too. There are about 40 trillion of cells, and they have different cell state. The cells that make up your skin and your other cells that make up your heart have the uh, same genome, but the state of the cell is different. If your cell becomes cancerous, it's also a change in the cell state. Cell biology is basically knowing about the cell state. In traditional biological analysis, such as Western blot here, or real-time PCR, you basically treat the cells at an order of 10 to the power of 5, or maybe more. So the result you get is an average of all these cells in the dish. However, recent reports show that cells that seem homogeneous are actually heterogeneous. So if you want to know about the cell in detail, you have to analyze it one by one. In 2018, single cell analysis method were chosen as breakthrough of the year in Science Magazine. Science Magazine is a very famous uh, journal in, uh, among our scientists. Uh, this image was taken by fluorescent microscope, which is one of the most commonly used methods to know about the state of the cell in single cell. So, what are the ways to know about the cell state? There are many ways to know about the cell state as knowing the cell state is one of the major tasks in cell biology. Traditional methods include Western blood analysis or quantitative PCR, microarray analysis or proteomics such as uh, mass spec. And these are very strong methods that, uh, that can tell about the cell comprehensively. So you, that means you can get lots of information. 
However, these cells are not single cell capable, and they just a destructive method, meaning you have to kill the cells. There are methods such as microscopy, parks, or fish, and these methods are single cell capable, and some of these methods can be done in live cell. However, information you can get is quite limited. It basically depends on the labeling. So the, it can report at most uh, five to six parameters because it's basically five to six colors. Uh, recently, single cell methods were developed such as a single cell PCR or single cell mass spec, all those things. Those methods are still quite difficult and requires hard labor and big amount of money. But then, the question is, do we really need to know about the comprehensive information to know the cell state? These are bright field image of the cells. Uh, some of them are ES cells or 3T3 cells or HeLa cells. And if you know these cells, you can tell which cells are which just by seeing this bright field image. And here's the answer. And probably you've got it right if you did any cell culture. On the other hand, it's quite difficult to distinguish between two, these two cell types by transcriptomics or proteomics. So if you have indices that can tell about the cell state, we might not need a comprehensive analysis. There are many indices we can think of. It can be a bright field image like this, or it can be a movement of these like vesicle inside the cells, or it can be a stiffness measured by AFM. We choose Rama spectrum from the cells because it contains lots of information. So, what is Raman? Raman scattering. Raman scattering or Raman spectroscopy is often used in chemical analysis. Um, you, are, you are chemists, so you probably know what they are, or maybe some of you might have already used it in some ways. It was found by this guy, C.V. Raman, uh, with his uh, colleague, uh, K.S. Krishnan, in 1928. He was awarded a Nobel Prize for this in 1930, so just two years after he found this uh, Raman scattering. He found that light scattered from the substrate, the color different from the instant light was included. At this time, laser was not developed. The laser was developed in the 1960s, so they used mercury lamp instead. They didn't have CCD camera at that time, so they used photographic film like this guy. So, with low intensity light and low sensitivity of the film, they sometimes took a few days just to take this kind of spectrum. Nowadays, we have nice small laser and detectors, so Raman scattering measurement is much simpler. You might have seen this kind of detectors at the airport. Those devices uh, can measure specific spectra of explosives using this device. So if you go to the airport with dynamite or something, you get caught. Maybe you might heard about uh, Mars Expedition 2020. They're already launched and on their way to Mars. And on that uh, rocket, they have a rover that ran around Mars. Um, Raman spectroscope is equipped on this rover to detect any sign of life which might have existed in the past. So Raman is used in many ways nowadays. So what is Raman scattering? When light enters a molecule, light enters a molecule, three types of scattering are generated. LED scattering, which has the same wavelength to the incoming light. 
so it has the same energy. And there are Stokes Raman and anti Stokes Raman scattering. These Raman scattering gives or taking some portion of the energy from the vibrational energy of the molecule and thus have different wavelengths from the incoming light. So because of this shift of the wavelengths from the incoming light depends on the molecular vibration, you can tell what kind of molecules exist there. This is an example of the Raman spectrum from nucleic acids. As you can see, nucleic acids looks quite similar in its shape or in its composition. But Raman spectrum are very different. And you can distinguish between nucleic acids from this spectrum. There are various modes of Raman spectroscopy such as uh, stimulated Raman or coherent anti-stoke Raman cars or SAS, uh, surface enhanced Raman spectrum or tip enhanced Raman spectrum. But today I will only talking about uh, spontaneous Raman today because it has more information than other methods. Obtaining Raman spectrum from live cell is not easy as for fluorescent microscopy because Raman signal is far more weaker than fluorescent microscope fluorescence. The laser power tends to be much stronger and the exposure time tends to become longer. That means you'll be eliminating your cells with strong laser for a long, long time. And that's quite, uh, quite not good for the cells. To overcome this issue, we built a line scan microscope. The cells will be eliminated in line like this. And the spectrum will be simultaneously obtained on this line. So in this line, you get spectrum like this. Using this line scanning microscopy, we can obtain this kind of cell image in about 20 minutes. So each pixel has a spectrum like this. Now, uh, this is an ex example of the Raman image, uh, Raman spectra, Raman image, and Raman spectra of 23 fibroblasts. As you can see, Raman spectrum from the cell is very complicated because there are many kinds of molecules existing within a focal spot. A Raman spectra will be a convolution of the spectrum from all these molecules. This image was made using three distinct peak, peaks. Uh, this is cytochrome C in blue. Uh, this is uh, amide one, which is mostly proteins in green. Uh, CH bonds, which are mainly from lipids in red. And you can get, obtain this kind of image. Although they are many other peaks, it is difficult, difficult to tell which peak corresponds to what molecule. So some of them are annotated like this. So however, although you cannot annotate all those peaks, lot of, there are a lot of peaks existing means there are a lot of information included in this spectrum. So this uh, complicated spectrum will probably be reflecting your cell state. So our strategy is that we don't try to annotate these peaks, but just compare the shape of the spectra with the cell state and try to identify the cell state using Raman spectrum. Okay, now let me show you some example and convince you that Raman can do various things in the cell state. Here is the cell lines from mouse. This is a famous 3D3 fibroblast. This is uh, EPH4, which is epithelial cell. And this is HEPA16 uh, hepatocytes. Because all these cell lines are derived from mouse, genetic information is basically same or similar, but only the cell state is different. 
as you can see, they are Raman spectrum. <laughs> um, well, this uh, 3T3 in blue, um, EPH4 in purple, and hepatocyte in orange. And as you can see, Raman spectrum are quite different between these cell lines. To compare the shape of this uh, spectrum, they all employ principal component analysis, PCA. Uh, this is the score plot, and as you can see, these three cell lines appear in a different location like this, meaning you can discriminate these cell lines using Raman. So three cell lines are in different cell state, and we can distinguish, distinguish them using Raman. That means we can say we can predict cell state using Raman. However, these cell lines were established long, long time ago. Some of them are established half centuries ago, meaning that the cell state of these cells are quite different between uh, lines. So it's not that surprising that you can discriminate like this in Raman. So next question is, can Raman distinguish smaller change in the cell state? So we picked uh, cell differential, differentiation as a model. So we picked uh, two cell lines that is that can be differentiated. Uh, this is a neural 2A, which differentiate into neuronal cells. This is a 3T3L1, which differentiate into adipocytes. These two, these are before induction of differentiation, and this is after induction of differentiation. And as you can see in the score plot, PC score plot, cell state difference before and after the induction of differentiation can be distinguished by Raman. Please note that some of the cells uh, after differentiation remain in the undifferentiated area like this, which is quite typical in uh, differentiating, differentiating these cells as some cells fail to differentiate. So this time, it's same cell line, but the cell state is different before and after differentiation. And meaning small cell change, small cell state change in can be distinguished using Raman. Now we can detect gradual change in the cell state using Raman, like this. This is the spontaneous differentiation of uh, mouse embryonic stem cells and as you can see, we can detect gradual change in the cell state using Raman. This uh, figure is a little bit complicated, so this is a uh, large slide of the PCS score plot of ESL differentiation. Cell state was quite homogeneous like this before the induction of differentiation, which became uh, heterogeneous as you differentiate. And after uh, two weeks, it end up in a different uh, different location in the PCS score plot plane. So you can, so using Raman, you can predict the time course change in cell state during differentiation. Uh, this slide shows you that you can do similar thing with myogenesis uh, muscle differentiation. So you can, so I think we can skip this slide. But now. I have shown you that one can tell difference between cell lines and also see the difference in the cell state during differentiation. But actually, these changes, cell differentiation, are, are quite a big difference in the cell state. The differentiation process takes more than a week. Some, some of them take two weeks. And you can even tell that the, dif the difference by just seeing the, uh, the image. So then, how about the case in the smaller change of the cell state, such as in the case of cell activation? As a model, we, enter, uh, we chose uh, T cell activation. When antigen enters into your body, it will be taken up by this antigen-presenting cells and digested, and then 
it will present it with the cell surface. When specific T cell that can recognize that recognize that uh, antigen interact with this antigen presenting cell like this, it will become activated and undergo a rapid proliferation and become effector T cells. So let's see if we can visualize this process using Raman. This blue line is before activation, and this red line is after activation. Instead of using antigen-presenting cells, T cells were activated using anti-CD3 and anti-CD28 antibodies. And as you can see, Rama spectrum are quite different before and after activation, and clearly separated in PCA. Using these PCA scores in discriminant analysis, activation status can be clearly visible like this. So basically now we have a mathematical axis to be distinguish between inactivated and activated T cells. So we can probably see the intermediate activation status like this. This is the time course change of the activation status, activation status score, that's previous F1 score. And it, this activation status score quite resembles that of the activation status measured by CD69, which is a typical way to measure the activation of the T cells. This activation uh, score can be calculated for each pixel in the Raman image. So if you have this kind of uh, cell aggregation where this uh, APC uh, antigen uh, presenting cells are surrounded by these T cells, uh, this is a peripheral image, you can basically see in Raman and see the activation status. This is activation status image the green color shows inactivated state, and red color shows activated state, and blue shows the APC. And as you can see, this cell, which means this cell is uh, well activated. However, this cell here, which is this cell here, is not that much activated, and APC is here. So that means, like this, Using Raman spectrum, we can do similar thing as in a fluorescence microscopy. Okay, let me take a sip of my coffee and go to the next. Yeah. Okay. Now, as I do this kind of presentation in other places, the question I always get is, can you predict the expression of specific gene, or specific like protein expression? And the answer I always return is no. Basically, Raman tells us overall change in the cell state, and it won't tell us something in detail. But is that so? To answer this question, we did a series of experiments trying to predict the gene expression. In this attempt, we decided to try out in bacteria, because bacteria has less genes compared with mammalian cells. For example, E. coli has about 4,000 genes, whereas humans has about 20,000. So using E. coli simplifies everything. We use E. coli having antibiotic resistance, which was made in the laboratory by culturing them under the presence of antibiotics. This panel shows that some bacteria can proliferate under the presence of, of antibiotics. Then antibiotic resistance E. coli was made using 10 different antibiotics like this. What we did is simple. We obtained Raman spectrum uh, fr from each antibiotic biotic resistant E. coli and uh, get the, the gene expression. 
and compared using partial least square method. By using partial least square model, we can obtain correlation between Raman spectrum and gene expression. Uh, for example, this is uh, gene CYOA, positively correlates to the, this region of spectrum, this region, this region, and this region, and negatively correlates with this region here, and here, and here. Uh, so looking at the genes responsible for um, cell wall metabolism, this ARC-A and ARC-B genes linearly uh, correlates with this region of the peak, peak region to 950. And this uh, gene, LA, LB, correlates with this, these peaks. And <coughs> some correlation depends on the E. coli strain. For example, uh, this uh, prophylaxing antibiotic resistant E. coli, the genes responsible for DNA gyrase these well, were well correlated to the peak of this 1079 and 1101. In this uh, neomycin antibiotic resistant E. coli, the genes responsible for protein synthesis were well correlated, correlated to the peak at 730 and 1476. Having uh, many, many of these results, a model was created to predict the gene expression from Raman spectrum. And as you can see, gene expression was successfully estimated from the Raman spectrum with this, uh, with this much accuracy. So Raman spectral spectroscopy is now used in medical fields such as uh, cancer diagnosis, like this, or pathological diagnosis. And <coughs> new instruments like this were released every year. So I think this kind of trend that Ramaspropy used in medical field will continue to increase in the future. Uh, last but not the least is uh, <coughs> collaborators who did this work. Uh, he's a big guy in the group. Um, he basically uh, did the build, building up of the microscope and he mainly did the uh, gene expression analysis study. Uh, thank you very much for your atten attention and um, I think I can take questions.